Are you sheltering in place, isolated, feeling alone? <coughs> well, then you're just like us. Hit me. From Studio P in Sausalito, the home of the quarantined hit, it's time for... Suckatash. Suckatash Shut-In, the Soundcast stimulus package featuring snippets from comedy... Soundcasts. And now, here's your host for this episode, Mark Hershaw. Mark Hershaw. Thanks, Bill Haywatt, our own master of the mic. I'm your every other episode host, Mark Hershon, ushering you through Epi 219 of Succotash Shut-In, the Soundcast Stimulus Package. If you missed episode 218 with our every other episode host, Tyson Saner, in which he featured snippets from comedy soundcasts The Honeydew Podcast with Ryan Sickler, The Bituation Room, and Vegan Abattoir, you can still fill your ears with Succotash at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, The Laughable App, and, of course, our home site, SuccotashShow.com. I've got a lot of nice responses and retweets to our episode 217, where I interviewed multi-threat talent Mike Berbiglia, and you can still listen to that show as well in all those places I just mentioned up above. But this week, I'm back to featuring a quadruple cluster of comedy soundcast clips. You can probably figure out my theme for this installment by the title, Mock and Murders and Other True Crimes. One of the most popular genres in soundcasting for the past few years, ever since Serial, actually back in 2014, is true crime. And following on the heels of it are the fake true crime shows. There have been some great ones. There's also been some bad ones. But I thought I'd feature a few of the best ones, past and present, in case you haven't had a chance to catch them yet. I'll be featuring clips from A Very Fatal Murder, Done Disappeared, My Neighbors Are Dead, and This Sounds Serious. Now, if you're too lazy to Google the podcast afterwards to find the complete episodes and seasons, we have all those titles linked from the blog entry to this episode at our home site, as well as some of the hosts and performers' tweets or Instagram feeds. And as always, Succotash Shut-In is sponsored by Henderson's Pants. This week featuring their new picnic pants, just in time for socially social distancing. And our other regular sponsor is TrumpPoetry.com, aiming a rhyming barrage of bombast squarely at the orange menace until he's out of office, or until this show finally gets a paying sponsor. Then we toss both of those freeloading ad peddlers out of Soundcastville. Before I get into our clippage, just a message from our management. Hi, it's me, Mark Hershon co-host and executive producer of Succotash Shut-In, the Soundcast Stimulus Package. Both Tyson Saner and I endeavor to make this show as interactive with your thoughts, suggestions, and wishes as we can. We normally feature clips as a way to let you get the lay of the land out there soundcast-wise. We also have occasional interviews with soundcasters. We typically don't put up prefab promos, preferring to let you hear each show on Natural. But what do you prefer? Is our mix okay? Rather have all clips, all interviews, Tyson and I talking to each other about some of the sh- Tyson and I talking to each other about some of the shows. We'd love to hear from you as we move through this pandemic political weirdness we're all immersed in. So drop us a line at either Mark at SuckatashShow.com or Tyson at SuckatashShow.com or call our toll full hotline at 818-921-7212 and leave us your thoughts. Thanks. Mark, back to you. Thanks, me. I have nothing more to add. Let's get to the clips. If you're a fan of true crime stories, real or imagined, you owe it to yourself to catch a very fatal murder produced by The Onion starting back with season one in 2018. There have been two seasons, eight episodes apiece, and a third season was supposed to drop this year, but I have found no sign of it yet. The intrepid, kudos-hungry citizen journalist is a soundcaster named David Pascal, voiced by David Sidoroff, who also wrote the soundcast with head writer Katie Yeiser. The first season involves trying to find the perpetrator of the perfect murder of Haley Price, a beloved high school student in the small town of Bluff Springs, Nebraska. This clip is from the premiere episode of the first season, where Pascal arrives in town and begins to sketch out a typical American town where murder can happen. Haley Price was a typical 17-year-old with big dreams and clear skin when she was killed. She was a high achiever, a debate champion, a prom queen, a doting girlfriend. But Haley also excelled at being murdered. One chilly Thursday morning in May, Haley was found on the floor of the local bottle cap factory that her father worked at. 
What's more, she was dead. Haley's case fulfilled every one of the requirements we had plugged into Ethel. It was gruesome. It was unsolved. It commented on the ugly underbelly of the American dream, the decline of manufacturing, modern beauty standards, the gig economy, factory farming, deforestation, saturated fats, the fragility of love, the golden era of television, and CO2 emissions. And most importantly, no one had done a podcast about it yet. 100% match. Retrieving. Coroner's report. The coroner's report the Bluff Springs Police Department provided states that Haley Price was shot three times in the head. She had multiple stab wounds. She was strangled and smothered with a pillow. She was soaking wet and had clearly been drowned. She had dirt of the same composition found on Mars under her fingernails. She had been dead for seven hours when her body was found, but her fingernails had been painted 15 minutes ago. She was wearing the class ring of a boy who wasn't her boyfriend Brian, even though he's a great guy and deserves way better. She had scratches on her arms and a bite mark on her leg. She was wearing a shirt that, according to her best friend Alex, was super ugly and not her style at all. Her hair had been cut into a Beatles mop top. So what happened to Haley Price? And how can I get in on it? It's a full moon! Horrible. Just horrible. I'd keep an eye on Callaway if I were you. What do you mean Haley's dead? Oh my god, you didn't know? From The Onion and Onion Public Radio, I'm David Pascal. And this is a very fatal murder. Morning there. Can I get you a seat? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Bluff Springs, Nebraska is a small town. Not much more than a collection of barns and cars. But the people who live here love it. And if you're the kind of person who watches CBS and likes organized religion, it's easy to see why. Bluff Springs is safe. It's the kind of town where no one locks their door, and parents don't have to worry about letting their kids walk their hogs around the neighborhood at night. That's why it was so shocking to the people of Bluff Springs when this happened. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, I'm at the factory. It's Haley Price, and she's dead. When Haley was murdered, it shook this town to its core. After all, most of the people who live here had never met a podcast host let alone a podcast host from New York City. They weren't used to stuff like this. I just can't imagine anyone in this town doing a thing like that. It's real sad. It's got everyone feeling on edge, you know? Everyone's kind of jumpy, I think. Horrible. Just horrible. Have you ever been interviewed for a podcast before? Well, I, I don't believe so. Life here is quiet. It's simple. A lot of the families in Bluff Springs have been here for generations. And as I drove through town and passed yet another novelty mailbox painted to look like a rooster, I couldn't help thinking, evolution is a funny thing. The town's main road is lined by a few small businesses, a pet store, a post office. Haley's High School is there, too. It's the type of school where the football field is bigger than the chemistry lab, and kids learn to throw a baseball before they take the SATs. The bottle cap factory where Haley was found is on this road, too, and a single wind turbine, which I assume provides the town's only energy and entertainment just about a mile off it. On the side of the turbine, the name W.O. Calloway is painted in rusty red. You notice it right away when you take the Bluff Springs exit off the interstate. So funny. If you dig this type of rope-a-trope comedy as much as I do, do yourself a favor and dive into a very fatal murder. In the spirit of Wondry's The Vanished came Done Disappeared, a three-season so far show that started in 2017. Investigative soundcaster John David Booter, which may or may not be a fictional nom de cast, goes in search of the truth behind the disappearance of Clara Pockets, a Pennsylvania woman. The very first episode has Booter arriving at the scene of a crime which may or may not be the scene of the crime, but it's a mess either way. I left in Booter's live reading of a Me Undies commercial because it's pretty darn funny. I, I don't think it's a legit spot, but I am jealous that Succotash, which has been soundcasting since 2011, has never had Me Undies as a sponsor. Around 5.15 p.m., a Piggly Wiggly employee named Gert Roberts clocked out and walked to her car. When she got there, she noticed the parking spot next to her was empty except for a birthday cake smeared on the pavement. It had fresh tire tracks imprinted in the frosting. It was a white cake with chocolate ganache. There were rainbow-colored sprinkles littered generously over what had presumably been the top. It was about 12 inches in diameter, big enough for about 6 to 12 slices, depending on how many people were eating it. 
Gert instantly recognized the cake. She remembered that while she was decorating it, she thought it was a little small for a birthday party. It would never be enough. It was like serving a personal pizza to a bunch of children. It didn't scream party. She later said she had thought that the woman ordering it was making a huge mistake, one she'd regret. But there was no telling if the cake would have been big enough to feed the whole party, because that woman was Clara Pockets. And the cake was sugary sweet roadkill. But where was Clara Pockets? Who took her? Had she been taken? Where would this story lead me? Was this a good idea? What if nobody listens to this podcast? Will I ever be able to monetize it? Should I just be satisfied doing it for my own creative fulfillment? Will Lisa listen to it? Will Robert? What if everyone laughs at me? Is there a God? And if there is, may I speak with him? Because at this point, it seemed like he was the only one who'd be able to tell me anything about what happened to Clara Pockets. Hi, I'm John David Booter, and I'm here to tell you about one of our sponsors, Me Undies. Me Undies is the most comfortable underwear you'll ever own. Made from clouds and baby skin, you will never wear another pair of underwear ever again. Seriously, I would rather cut off my own dick, sell it to a bunch of school children, and live the rest of my life as a dickless sex offender than ever take them off. Go to MeUndies.com slash disappeared and put in the promo code John David Booter. And your first pair is free. I got my first pair two months ago, and I still haven't switched out. Try it today. You will not be disappointed. When police arrived at the Piggly Wiggly around 518, the cake was still smeared across the empty parking spot, just as Gerd had found it. They loved dessert and were extremely excited. One by one, each officer knelt down and, with an index finger, scooped up a big bunch of cake and frosting and put it in their mouth. It was delicious, but they couldn't help but notice. Something seemed off. Like the cake wasn't big enough for a birthday party. A typical children's birthday party in America hosted anywhere from 15 to 30 children, and the officers thought the cake looked like it would serve about six, eight people at best. They all started walking around in small circles, looking up at the sky, and thinking, who could have taken Clara? Where was she? And why? So that's how Dunn Disappeared kicked off its first season. I found an Indiegogo page where Booter was looking to raise money for a new season that almost got to his $10,000 goal. He also talked about doing some spin-offs, but I'm not sure how things are on that. Follow the link on our blog to his Facebook page and maybe find out more. As I mentioned before the clip, we have never had Me Undies as a sponsor of Succotash, but we have always had Henderson's Pants. Hello, friends. Summer may be winding down, but with plenty of warm weather still ahead, now is the perfect time to take advantage of Henderson's annual sale on Picnic Pants, You know, you shouldn't wear white after Labor Day, but don't let that old saw stop you from slipping into a pair of white and red-checked Henderson's Picnic Pants. Roomy, cool, and comfortable, Henderson's Picnic Pants are a walk in the park. And once you've found that perfect spot to plop down your basket, that's when your Picnic Pants go into action. One firm tug achieves easy release, and the pants legs unfurl to form a ground cover wide enough to accommodate the entire family. Specially built pockets hold an entire arsenal of sporks, while the insulated pockets, both front and rear, keep plenty of coleslaw, potato salad, and condiments on ice until you're ready to eat. I know what you're thinking, what about my meat? Well, friends, with Henderson's patented concealed crotch cooler, there is plenty of space to tuck away those weenies, brats, and patties until the coals are hot enough to stick them on the grill. And with our buttocks basket, you'll be sure to have an ample supply of buns on hand. 
In addition to being both stain and water resistant, picnic pants are insect repellent too. Which means there'll be no ants in your pants when it comes time to bid adios to your favorite park or beach luncheon spot. Originally designed for SEAL Team 6, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and the Donner Party, Henderson's Picnic Pants are now available on sale wherever fine tarpaulins and mulch are sold. That's Henderson's, makers of fine trousers and pantaloons since 756 A.D. And now, back to Succotash. This episode of Succotash is sponsored in part by TrumPoetry.com, a chronological ode to a fake muse. Enjoy a rhyming spin on the news of the day every day, as well as over 500 archived daily verses thoroughly covering the White House, America, and the world with a sticky caramel coating that's impossible to remove. That's TrumPoetry.com. Everything you need to know in rhyming couplets. TrumPoetry. Our ace producer-engineer, Joe Polino, the man behind TrumpPoetry.com, has assured me that whether Trump wins or loses the upcoming election, he will be retiring from cranking out a poem a day in his one-man effort to rhyme the current administration away. So click over to TrumpPoetry.com and bask in the wonderfulness that Joe has created before it's too late for us all. Okay, this next show we're featuring is a little different from the true crime spoof. My Neighbors Are Dead, which we originally clipped back in 2017, is more meta than that. It works on the premise that horrific murders from movies, like Nightmare on Elm Street and the Jason movies, are real. And the host, Adam Peacock, interviews some of the lesser-known characters and often survivors of those films. It's also improvised, unlike the other three shows we're featuring this episode, which are tightly written and produced pieces. We're clipping the most recent installment, Halloween H2O, with guest Lauren Ash, who you may know from Superstore and the Giving It Up For Less soundcast. She's on board to talk about her love of the Halloween franchise, but she also portrays a hapless single mom whose van gets stolen by Michael Myers in the movie Halloween H2O. Is everything okay? Have you found everything okay, uh, uh, Claudia, before we jump into all this? Oh, uh, yeah. No, I'm, I, yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I've, this is my first time on a... On one of these calls. So. Oh, great. Well, it'll be super easy. I, I won't keep you here very long. I just want to hear a little bit about your story. But uh, let me introduce you. Joining me from Summer Glen, California, Claudia Davis. Hi. 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 It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so much I, I want to I want to talk to you about mm-hmm. uh, about panel mm-hmm. trucks and and you know your opinion on uh, rest stop areas. But uh, for those who might not know, you were, I don't even know how to say this, uh, a victim of yeah. the serial killer Michael Myers. Yeah, I'm one of the ones that they don't really talk about in the news. Um, it, sorry, it's just still, it's very fresh. Uh, no, it's okay. Take your time. Yeah, it was um, 1998 and my daughter Casey and I were uh, out for a drive mm-hmm. in um uh, the the truck I was driving at the time, and uh, my daughter Casey at the time was in this phase where she just wanted to pee outside all the time, and sure. I was trying to be, you know, a natural. I was going through a divorce, and I didn't want to, you know, impose anything on her, but I was really trying to get her to pee in toilets. Sure, is the thing. Yeah. Um, you know, because she had started school, and I mean, she was. I mean, it was becoming a recess occurrence every day that she'd go behind the monkey bars and drop trow. So oh, I, um, you know, we were on this drive and we were uh, in a very kind of rural wooded area. And yeah. she said, you know, I need to go. Can I like, let me go, let me pee outside. And I, I don't know why I just was, you know, I'm trying to be a good mother. I'm trying to shape her. I'm trying to shape her for the future. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I saw the rest stop and I thought, no, this is a, this is a teachable moment. And that's when Michael Myers came into my life and my entire life changed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wrong place, wrong time, I guess, huh? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I guess there's no real easy way to say this, but he stole your panel truck. He did, yeah. Um, I I was, you know, Casey was in the stall next to me. I would put my purse uh, on the floor, which in retrospect, I it was a very dirty floor and there was a hook. So I don't know why I made that choice. But um, he did. He, he came in. He stole my purse. 
um, which he ended up leaving actually, but he took my keys and he took, he took my truck. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, what was, what was, it was such a disturbing experience seeing him, you know, through the crack of the door there, um, in the bathroom. And, uh, when I came outside and saw that the, the truck was gone, I mean, a million things are running through my head. I can only imagine. Yeah. In you know, is moment. my daughter okay? Am I okay? You know. Well, I mean, I'd spent a lot of money on that truck. So it was also one of those things where I was, you know, the insurance was high. It was, it was, I'm a bit of an antique collector and it did kind of fall under that umbrella. Uh-huh. Um, and I had actually just spent, I've spent so much money fixing that thing up. So it was really, that was such a bummer. Such why, a bummer. I get, why a panel truck? What about a panel truck that really drew your, drew your eye? You know, I grew up, my father was a baker and I have a memory of being in a truck that smelled like fresh baked bread, you know, cause we would make the deliveries ourselves. He'd bake the mm-hmm. bread in the middle of the night and then we'd, my mother and I actually would get in the truck and, and deliver the bread house to house. Uh, I grew up in a very small town. Uh, it was only about six loaves, six houses. Um, I mean, still it, though, that's the that most was, Americana thing I've heard. Oh, well, God bless you. Uh, but that really was something that was just such a happy memory for me. And when my husband cheated on me um, with this woman, uh, Becky Gardner, um, you can find her on Facebook. She uh, – it was it was so devastating. I just wanted to surround myself with comfort and that truck yeah. was just such a symbol of comfort for me, um, which now has become such a symbol of, of you know my life falling apart. I love how inventive these spoof casts can get. And the fact that Adam Peacock brings in improvisers who can jump into these somewhat obscure characters to help celebrate the tropes and cliches this particular show embodies is really fun. Which brings us to the final clip we're featuring this week. It's from a show we've featured several times in the past, mainly because I think it's not only hilarious and incredibly well-written, performed, and produced, but I've also got a huge pod crush on the producers Kelly and Kelly, who do a who do a whole lot more than this sounds serious, and it's all funny. The third season just dropped for this show, and I reviewed the first episode last week for This Week in Comedy Podcasts over on Vulture.com. The host for the show is still Gwen Radford, voiced by Carly Pope, yet another intrepid soundcast journalist, but one who's fixated on 911 calls. This time around in the season entitled Grand Casino, it's a call from back in 1991 that puts her on the path of tracking down a Hollywood con man. They tap into some solid soundcast casting with Paul F. Tompkins and Gary Anthony Williams and a whole bunch of other folks. But there's also some voices from the Kelly and Kelly stable that really know how to come across as almost the real deal if the situations weren't quite so cracked. Dig this. See, Kirk Todd didn't start off as Kirk Todd. He was born Jeremy Weaver in the early 50s in Madison, Wisconsin. That's Janice Russell. She's a journalist who has profiled several con artists for various magazines. I love con artists. I love how they make everyone else sound so stupid. You talk to a victim and you say, you just met this guy. Why did you give him your entire life saving? And all they can say is, I don't know, you had to be there. According to Janice, Jeremy Weaver had a troubled childhood. His parents divorced when he was eight, and then he fell in with the wrong crowd. Before he was a con man, Jeremy Weaver was a real con boy. You know, had a whole crew of little con boys that he ran with. They would run card games in their neighborhood. Running three card Monty, four card Monty. We got enough boys together, even up to ten card Monty. In the late 60s, still a teenager, Jeremy ran away to San Francisco. That's when he seems to have made the decision that being a con man is what he wanted to do with his life. And while Jeremy was the right age to be part of the free love and drug scene, Janice says he saw the hippies as a bunch of marks. He used to run a scam called the Acid Trip. He'd find a group of hippies tripping on LSD and then he'd literally trip over them. He'd fall down and tell them they had to cover his medical expenses. Uh, They probably thought they were talking to a goblin who was demanding some crystals and goat skeletons, but all the while he was making money. As the hippie movement came to an end, Jeremy relocated again. Without graduating high school or even taking the SATs, Jeremy got into Princeton University, an Ivy League school. He forged transcripts and wrote an essay about his life growing up in Montana, raising buffaloes and studying quantum physics, none of which was true. I mean, I don't think that's true of anyone's life. At Princeton, he began using an alias, Kenny Trammell. He spent two years studying philosophy and joined one of the university's a cappella groups, the Fifenstocks. Down at old Gordon Hall, the pipes we really 
sing it all. Celtic jigs and sing along. I'm sorry, are you going to be uh, altering my voice at all uh, for the program or not? I'm, the hope is that you won't. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite proud of my dulcet tones. Von de Boucher was a member of the Fiefenstocks with Jeremy, now known to them as Kenny. I certainly remember Kenny. According to Von, Jeremy, or Kenny's, most memorable contribution to the group was when he helped them out of a predicament. It started like this. Kirk landed a gig for the Fife and Stocks in 1973, opening for the Allman Brothers at a nightclub in New York. We were pinching ourselves. We really couldn't believe it. Kenny landed us this incredible gig. The Allman Brothers. We didn't know their music, but we certainly knew the name. I mean, not the most likely musical pairing. On one side, a gritty southern rock band, and on the other, these prissy rich boys in orange turtlenecks. Which wasn't even their uniform. They just all accidentally wore that to the show. But the gig did not go well. I think when we hit the stage, well, the nerves got the better of us. Uh, We just didn't bring our A game. And more our A flat game. (laughs) Regardlessly, it was a horrible experience. I mean, we were uh, booed off the stage, uh, soaked in beer, uh, uh, pelted with batteries. The group was humiliated by the events of that night and vowed never to speak of it again. But someone was recording their performance, and there's a tape of the whole thing. Good evening, everyone. We are Life and Stars from Princeton University. Gentlemen, we have And a few months later, this someone contacted the group anonymously and threatened to release the tape to the campus radio station if he wasn't paid $10,000. So the group paid off the anonymous blackmailer, who was, of course, Jeremy Weaver. Jeremy orchestrated the whole thing, from setting up the gig to blackmailing the group. He even acted as the go-between when the group came up with the money. So Kenny took the money and made the swap. And nobody ever heard that tape. The tape that I sent you. You're not planning on playing that on your podcast, are you? There's a slice from the first episode of the third season of This Sounds Serious, Grand Casino. You can get the episodes as they drop over the next six or seven weeks in most of the podcast places, or you can go to their website and binge all eight episodes right now for just four ninety nine. And this just in, I'm trying to arrange to have the brains behind so much of the Kelly and Kelly content, Pat Kelly and Peter Olring, visit us here at Succotash Shut-In in an upcoming episode, so listen for that. All right, that's that. That's it. Dunzo. Epi 219 is in the can, so to speak. Tyson Saner and I will continue to bring you episodes of Succotash Shut-In every week. As long as we can, and as long as this extended period of lockdown or shelter in place continues, it's all to both celebrate comedy soundcasts and also to give you a chance to sample some shows you might not have heard or been aware of, given there are literally hundreds of thousands of soundcasts out there. If you want to reach me and or Tyson, you can address either of us at SuccotashShow.com or listen to Bill Haywatt's wrap-up coming up for things like the hotline number and the URL where you can upload clips from your own comedy soundcast directly to us to include on the show. Until next time, let's try not to be assholes to each other. Wear a mask. If you don't get that, there's really no way for us to be friends. And remember to please pass the Succotash. You've been listening to Succotash Shut In, the Soundcast Stimulus Package, with your host, Mark Hershon. Brought to you by Henderson's Pants, Trumpoetry.com, and... Imagine your company's name right here. Find us on the web at SuccotashShow.com, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on iHeartRadio, on YouTube, on SoundCloud, on the <laughs> laughable app, and tattooed on your mother's rear end. You can hear us streaming and like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at Succotash Show. Email us at marc at succotashshow.com. Or call into the Succotash Skype line at our toll call number 818-921-7212. 818-921-7212.
You can also upload clips from your favorite comedy soundcast directly to us using our direct upload link at Hightail.com slash you slash Succotash. Production of Succotash is overseen by Joe Paulino through the auspices of Studio P. Sausalito, the home of the hit. Our hosts are Mark Hershon and Tyson Sainer. Our musical director is Scott Carvey. Our booth assistant is still Kenny Durgis. And until next time, I'm your loyal booth announcer, Bill Haywatt, reminding you to please wash your hands and pass the Succotash. Goodbye. If you want to reach me and or Tyson, you can address either of us. You can address either of us at Succotash Show. If you want to reach me, if you want to reach me and or Tyson, you can address either of us at Succotash. Dude. If you want to reach me and or Tyson, you can. This has been a Succotash Patch production. <laughs>